Well, good evening. Just each and everybody here tonight, especially those we were not able to visit with this morning. Glad to have you among us. This evening's lesson is entitled, Against All the Gods of Egypt. And our text tonight is from Exodus chapter 12, verse 12. And as you can tell from the text and the title, we're going to be speaking about the ten plagues. For those that have the handout, you'll notice that it's different than what I normally hand out. In lieu of an outline, I've handed out a chart that I have revised uh, that I first made about eight years ago. The reason for that is, is the research and information that I have uh, has taken me weeks to put this all together and make it make sense the way I wanted it to make sense. And regrettably, it took about four pages of outline. And so rather than take up the printer with four pages and all the ink it would take to print it, I put most of the information onto this chart. And actually, the chart has, in some cases, more information than I even had time or, or room on the outline to put. But if anyone wants the outline, uh, you can get with me after services, and I would make sure that you you have a copy. I wasn't uh, doing it to withhold it, just for the matter of uh, materials that we have at hand. In a lesson like this, after all the information that I had gleaned, I had to sit back and ask myself, why was I doing it? And what did I hope for us to accomplish tonight in studying something as the ten plays? One of the things that I saw as I was going through this and made it made this story, this account rather, come to life. This is not just a fairy tale. This is history. This is a historical fact. In fact, we can see it referenced in the book of Joshua chapter 2. Rahab tells the spies that all of Jericho melted with their sight because of what had happened nearly 40 or around 40 years before. In 1 Samuel chapter 5, when the Philistines capture the ark and the plagues start happening, remember what was said by the elders in, in 1 Samuel chapter 6? Let us not harden our hearts as Pharaoh did. But let's what? When God had dealt, dealt them a decisive blow, they let the people go and they went from them. They said, let us not harden our hearts as Pharaoh did, referencing this account. And the Philistines said, let us let the ark of God go back home. And maybe these plagues that we're suffering will go with it. Those were written... Those were accounts written by men long past this account, not by Moses to authenticate his own story that he might have fabricated. It's historical fact. And it's not just something that happened arbitrarily and at random, as we're going to see. This is judgment against the land of Egypt and against their priests and against their gods and against their very culture and lifestyle. And the impact was felt not only by the Egyptians, but the Israelites who lived there, who had been inundated in that culture. And not only the Egyptians, but as I just pointed out, it was felt in the land of Canaan. It was felt up the coast in the Philistia. The impact of this event was so great and the magnitude so heavy on the minds of those people. When the Israelites came marching, they knew the God of Israel and they feared him. Isaiah said to the nation of Judah, in Isaiah 46, verse 9, he said, Remember the former things long past, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me. One of the things I want us to see as we go through this lesson is to impress upon us what the Egyptians must have felt like, what the Israelites must have felt like who didn't know Jehovah as he's about to display to them just as he's going to tell Pharaoh. I want us to kind of put our, not just... Think and dwell on the plagues. We're really not going to have time tonight to read the full accounts of the plagues. We're going to look and talk about the impact and the impact and the devastation that it had on the land is where the focus is going to be tonight. And as we go through this, I'm going to ask you to put yourself in these people's mindset so you can fully grasp what Jehovah was trying to show them and get the point across. Isaiah said, I am God, there is no one like me. One of the former things that has passed was God reminding Judah of in the time of Isaiah, was the power he displayed in bringing Israel out of Egypt. You know, this thought is reiterated in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. The Apostle Paul wrote, For there is one God and one mediator also between God and man, Christ Je the man, Christ Jesus. Paul's reiterating to, his, to Timothy that he might pass on to others. There is one God. This is a, a theme in the Old Testament. It's a theme in the New Testament. It's something that we need to grasp today, that there is one God. And one of the former things long past that Isaiah is talking about would be pointing back to this event. There was a Pharaoh that rose up that did not know Joseph. We can read in Exodus 1 verse 8. 
He enslaved the Israelites living in the land from the days of Joseph. And this was to fulfill God's word to Abraham in Genesis 15, 13 to 16. One of the things that we're going to notice about Egypt, and this has been said before, this isn't anything new. Egypt worshipped a pantheon of gods. And as you can, if you've already looked at the chart, and as we're going to talk about a little bit tonight, you can see that in many cases, there were multiple gods for one thing. They overlapped. The ten plagues of Egypt were not random, but instead were direct insults, challenges, and judgments from God on the gods of Egypt, on Pharaoh himself, for even he was worshipped as a god. In Exodus chapter 7, verse 4, I want us to turn to Exodus 7, verse 4, and then we're going to jump to chapter 10, verse 2. And look what God makes the statement here in Exodus 7, verse 4. He says, When Pharaoh does not listen to you, then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring out my hosts, my people, the sons of Israel, from the land of Egypt by great judgments. These weren't random acts of nature that God just stirred up against the people. We have to keep this in mind as we go through this. These were judgments. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 10, verse 2. In 10, verse 2, we'll back up to verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I may perform these signs of mine among them, and that you may tell in the hearing of your son and of your grandson how I made a mockery of the Egyptians, and how I performed my signs among them, that you may know that I am the Lord. God not only had to convince the Egyptians he was God, he had to convince the Israelites that he was God. Remember what Moses said? Moses was worried about this. He said, when I go to them and I tell them that you sent me, who do I, how would they know to, to believe me? Who do I tell them sent me? And he said, you tell them I am that I am has sent me. God had to convince the Israelites too. So there are these judgments that we're going to look at. God hit the whole land and then God would segregate the land where the Israelites would be completely and wholly protected from the judgments on Egypt, so that they would know that what Moses said was 100% the truth, and that they could put their trust, as Moses had done, in God. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 12, the text I referenced earlier, God says, For I will go through the land of Egypt on that night, and will strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. Moses was chosen to lead God's people out of Egypt. But we, and it's been said before, it's not anything new, but it was the power of God that was demonstrated to all the people that there is one God that moved the people out of Egypt, that moved the people into the wilderness to a place that he would guide them. God executed judgment against all the gods of Egypt, just as he, just as he said he would do. Without further ado, let's jump into the place as we have a lot of ground to cover. David's already threatened to ring the buzzer on me earlier, so. But, no, I'm kidding. The first plague, water changed to blood. In Exodus chapter 7, 14 to 25. The Nile was the heartbeat of the lifeline of Egypt. Any type of reading that you read, one of the things I was recognizing right away is there are more gods associated with the Nile than perhaps any other aspect of life in Egyptian culture. In fact, many of the gods that we're going to talk about that just due to room, I couldn't put that they were also a Nile god, or they had their origin in the Nile. Most of the gods of Egypt had some kind of tie to the Nile. And the reason was, was if you imagine this desert landscape they live in, the Nile cut across it, and it fertilized the land. They were able to grow things along the Nile. It was their heartbeat. When you read different historians that speak of Egypt and the Nile, they speak of it with almost a reverence and awe themselves, because of how much the people depended on the Nile. Not only was the Nile affected by this, but any water drawn or stored in jars for use later was turned to blood. And it said the fish were dying, the aquatic life were dying. It threatened the crops as well. We know crops can't grow off blood. They need water. It was a judgment on the gods worshipped in association to the Nile. The first of which that I have here is pronounced num or num. His title is Guardian of the Nile. He had a form of a man with a bull's or ram's head. In fact, we're going to look at this uh, a little bit later. He was sometimes depicted with a bull's head as he is here, and other times with a ram's head. It depended on the... It said it was really up to the artist with the intent that they were trying to get through. 
He's one of the earliest Egyptian deities, it is said. In fact, it says he was the original god of the source of the Nile. So in Egyptian mythology, he's the one that started the Nile, or breathed life into the Nile and made it flow. He was called the creator of the human body. But it's interesting when you talk about the, the Egyptian gods. He's not the creator of the, human, of the first human beings. There's another god, and we'll look at him later. There's another god that they believe created the first human being. But it's this guy that's credited with creating the human body. Kind of, kind of strange. And I'm not really going to go in tonight on the Egyptian mythology. We'll, there'll be some of those things that we'll, we'll touch on. But a lot of that I would encourage you to study on your own if you're really interested. There's some, some stuff that is so graphic in its immorality that uh, I feel it's for your own personal study. So some of those things we will leave out. He was worshipped in some places. This guy was so popular. He was worshipped in some places till the 2nd or 3rd centuries A.D. Now, by the 2nd century, a 2nd or 3rd century A.D., who was the power? Was it Egypt? Was it even the Greeks? Who was it? Rome. But yet this guy was so popular that despite the Roman gods, who a lot of them were attached names to Greek gods, who were attached names to a lot of these Egyptian gods, this guy by his name was still worshipped up until the 2nd and 3rd century A.D. The second is happy, and it's pronounced the way it's spelled, with one P, happy. The spirit of the Nile was his title, and he was also called its dynamic sense. Happy was the god of the annual Nile flooding. See, he's not the god of the Nile. He is the god of the flooding of the Nile. He's also called lord of the fishes, birds, and marshes. His form is that of a man with a large belly and a feminine chest. And sometimes, as it is here, depicted as twin genies. If you notice, they both have the same form and just in, uh, an inverted picture of them facing one another. He was green or blue-skinned, which symbolized the fertility of the Nile. And he's, not the, again, not the god of the Nile, like Noom was, the guardian of the Nile, but the god of the flooding of the Nile. And known as the lord of the fishes, birds, and marshes. Remember the account that you can read in Exodus chapter 7, 14 to 25. The Nile being turned to blood was killing off what? The fishes, the aquatic life. So not only is it a slam against Num, who is the source of the Nile, this guy who is lord of the fishes and the marshes, but then we also have this guy, this guy, actually a gal, Tararet, the goddess of the river was her title. She was the demon wife of Apep, who was called the god of evil. And her name means she who is great or the great one. Her form was a hippopotamus with feline limbs. She was the goddess of motherhood, a protector of motherhood, a protector in pregnancy and in childbirth. But she was a Nile goddess, and she was said to have walked up and down the Nile protecting all those that it's, whose lives it touched. We also get Nu, the god of the rivers and the abyss is his title. His form is a bearded blue-green man or a man with a frog's head or just a frog. Sometimes in form of a frog or a snake-headed snake woman. So he is sometimes male or female. His name means abyss. The word nu means abyss. It was interesting as I was reading about this guy. He was very popular, but he had no temples or centers of worship. There was nothing really erected to him other than in texts and in ritual format. Most of his things, he was celebrated or worshipped among the other more popular Nile gods. So they would give him reverence along with the more popular one that had a temple. The other interesting thing is because he had a form of a frog sometimes, he was also depicted as female. And the name when he was a female form, his name was Nanette, which is the female version of Nu, which also means abyss. As we look at these different gods, and there are much more, but these suffice to say that there are gods that should have never allowed the Nile to be turned to blood, if you were to believe Egyptian mythology. And yet, none of these gods had the power to overturn God's judgment. And in fact, in Exodus chapter 7, verse 22, we can read, The magicians of Egypt did the same with their secret arts, and Pharaoh's heart was hard, and that he did not listen to them, as the Lord had said. You know, as a kid, I was always... Impressed by this part. Wow, they could duplicate the trick? That's so Pharaoh hardened his heart. But you know what, as I look at it now, Pharaoh's heart really had to be hardened because notice this. They couldn't cure it. 
So what? That they could duplicate the trick and turn water into blood. Why don't, if they can turn it into blood, why can't they turn it pure again? Wouldn't that mean more the impressive trick for Pharaoh? He didn't want the water to blood. He wanted it back to pure living water. But they couldn't cure it. All they could do is through their secrets and their sleight of hand and their sorcery, duplicate the trick. And despite all this, Pharaoh hardened his heart and the next plague began. The next plague, the second plague, frogs. In Exodus 8, 1 to 15, you can read about it. Frogs were not uncommon to Egypt, particularly near the Nile. But they didn't normally, as Exodus 8, verse 6 is going to say, they didn't normally cover the land. In 8, verse 6, so Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. That was not a normal occurrence. Even during times of Nile flooding, that was not a normal occurrence. This was judgment on the god Heket, and we might even say the god knew who had the form of a frog. But Heket was a very interesting study as I was reading about this. Her title was Goddess of Life and Fertility, and in their mythology, their mythos, she was a daughter of Ra. Her form was a frog or a frog-headed woman. She was considered the goddess of the Nile flooding. Now you might say, well, I thought Nu or, or Happy was the, the god of the Nile flooding. Not the event itself. See, they've got it split out. Not the event itself, but the life, the fertility that the Nile flooding brought. So you've got the god of the Nile, a god in charge of flooding the Nile, and this god in charge of bringing forth life from the flooding of the Nile. It was an annual event. Happy was the, the god of the flood. But the life that it brought, thus she was a fertility goddess. And it was said that she assisted women in childbirth. I want us to read Exodus chapter 8, verse 3. It says, The Nile will swarm with frogs, which will come up and go into your house, and into your bedroom, and on your bed, and into the houses of your servants, and on your people, and into your ovens, and into your kneading bowls. Imagine. Uh, she was known to assist people in childbirth. So think about that. You've got this frog that assists you in childbirth. And now imagine the hundreds of frogs. He says they're going to be jumping on your beds. Imagine what the people must have thought. And to put us further into the people's mindset, something that I did not know, is that even the involuntary slaughter of a frog was punishable by death. When, the, if, when I was reading this, one, of, one source said that the image of a dead frog would strike fear in any God-fearing, meaning lowercase God-fearing individual. The reason is someone's got to move that. Someone's got to dispose of it. They treated the frog, even in its dead form, with reverence and with awe. Okay? Get that in your mind. And then we've got all these swarms of frogs. They don't know what to do with them. For one, you'd think they would be praising Heket for blessing them. Right? That's not what happened. We see in Exodus 8, 13 to 14. It says, The Lord did according to the word of Moses. This is, Pharaoh doesn't pray to Heket to get the frogs out of the way. He calls Moses and Aaron and he pleads with them to get rid of the frogs. So in verse 13, the Lord did according to the word of Moses and the frogs died out of the houses, the courts, and the fields. Now, as we're going to look at some of these other plagues, when they were filled with insects and these other things, a wind would blow and drive them away, right? That's not what happened with the frogs. God didn't just herd them all back into the Nile and they went from which they came. He kills them where they lay. Think about the mental an emotional anguish that would do to the people. That if you were responsible for the death of a frog, it was punishable by death. Think about that. What are you going to do with all the swarms of dead bodies of frogs in your homes, in your gardens, and in your beds, and wherever they are in the streets? Think of the, the visual and put yourself in the mindset of a people who are scared to death of the, of the body of a dead frog. Read verse 14. So they piled them in heaps, and the land became foul. Now this was not an accident. God didn't just drive them back into Nile. He was making a point. He was God over his creation. And no false god over Egypt was going to just make those bodies of frogs magically disappear. The people were going to handle them, touch them, and it says they irreverently piled them in heaps. What a devastating impact upon the land, especially to those involved with the worship of the cat. Now, this false god did not have the power to overturn God's judgment. 
In fact, we can go back to chapter 8, verse 7. And it says, The magicians did the same with their secret arts, making frogs come up on the land of Egypt. So here, Pharaoh hardens his heart again. The magicians did the same. But notice, they couldn't cure it. They just added to the problem, we might say. Just as they did with the, with the water. Think of, if they turned water to blood, that means they had a source of water that hadn't been turned to blood yet. And they fouled it rather than cure it. There was a spot not covered by a frog yet. They put a frog there. They duplicated. They added to the problem. They were not part of the solution. And yet, Pharaoh, seeing that, said, Oh, it's just a trick. And he hardened his heart. And this, so despite all this, he recognized who had the power to stop it. And notice he didn't go to his magi. He didn't go to the priests of Heket. In Exodus chapter 8, verse 8. It says, Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that he remove the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go that they may sacrifice to the Lord. On this second plague of the frogs, Pharaoh breaks. I will do as you ask, just get rid of the frogs. And despite all this, Pharaoh hardened his heart, and the next plague began. But this one was a little bit different before we go to that point. God gave Pharaoh the honor this time to name the end of the plague. And Pharaoh said, tomorrow. So God honored it. And the next day, the frogs all died. He didn't get rid of them. The Egyptians had to do that. But even after seeing it, the crisis was gone. He hardens his heart. And the next plague begins. The third plague, lice or gnats. The reason I have the, the Hebrew word up there is because different translations say different things. Some say lice, some say gnats. The reason is, is and this, is a, this takes place in Exodus 8, <clears throat> 16 to 19. The Hebrew word is the word kin, and it's Strong's 3654. And it literally means to dig. And what I, the reference I was looking at said it refers to lice or gnats, plural. When it's talking about a swarm or, or a great magnitude or multitude of them or, or more than one, this is the word that has been used, and it means to dig. And if you think of lice, it might be a more better translation than that, because the word literally means to dig that is used there. But it's translated as lice, gnats, sand flies, or fleas, and if you think about what those creatures do when they land on you, you got a pretty good idea of what it was causing to the people. The interesting thing about this, this was judgment on the god, false god Geb. Geb's title was great god of the earth. He is considered the earth god. His form was a bearded man or a man with a snake head. He is the god of earth fertility and he's usually depicted as engaged in eternal sex with not his wife, goddess of the sky. In fact, many of these pictures are a lot more graphic. He's depict this is his hieroglyph. That's how he's depicted. This is his wife, Nut, said to be said to be the sky. He lays down, he's the earth, and lots of times, as you can imagine, this is a very graphic scene depicted in, in uh, Egyptian culture. I was glad I found one that wasn't as obscene. But the point is he's a fertility guy. He gives life to all things that creep and crawl in the crops that grow in the, on the earth. His priests had to shave their heads every day. Now this is what I find interesting. There, his priests had to shave their heads every day and their bodies every other day. Yeah, the reason you ask? So they don't get lice. In fact, his priests wore one of the most simple tunics known to Egyptian priests. His, his were considered, you talk about someone that looks very earthy, that's what you might say about one of his priests. They wore a very simple tunic. It didn't have a lot of embroidery on it because they didn't want places that bugs could get into. Now imagine the impact that this has, these lice, gnats, being on man and beast, covering them to the point of nuisance, not... Not just a random occurrence in nature, but a plague. Something that is so devastating that Pharaoh is going to ask Moses to entreat his God to remove it. Rather than go to Geb and say, hey, why don't you take the lice out of the land? I want us to just imagine the horror <laughs> of his priests being covered in lice despite their precautions. And it wasn't just his priests, but all the people. The goose was a sacred animal and it's often seen on his head. That's why you might be wondering about this one. It was said that he laid a cosmic goose egg from which sprang the sun and the whole world. So the goose is his holy symbol, though the goose was not considered sacred. And in fact, the goose was not considered holy in general. It just was his holy symbol. 
the, the, the goose became known as the Nile goose, and they deified it, and it was given a name that I can't pronounce, N-G-G-W-R, and it means great hunger. I just found that interesting. But even with all this, the false god Geb could not stop nor overturn the judgment from God. In Exodus 8, starting in verse 18, it says, The magicians tried with their secret arts to bring forth gnats, but they could not. So there were gnats on man and beast. They couldn't do this one. They did the water to the blood. They did the frogs. They couldn't do the lice or the gnats. Then the magician said to Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he did not listen to them as the Lord had said. His magic could not do it. In fact, they tell him, This is the finger of God. They're saying, This is, this is no trick. This is power beyond what we even know or have, or have seen. Yet despite all this, Pharaoh hardened his heart, and the next plague began. We get the fourth plague, the swarm of flies. Now in Exodus 8, 20-32, we can read this account. The flies, or the swarms, is this Hebrew word, Arab, and it's Strong 61, 57. And it means swarms. The word literally means swarms, but it's applied to swarms of all manner of swarms, of flies, mosquitoes, scarabs, any of these types of, of bugs. And this one becomes different. In this one, Goshen, where the Israelites live, would be unaffected. God's telling Pharaoh, you're going to be covered in these things. You're going to have your, these swarms of flies or, or mosquitoes or whatever they are. And he says, but the land of Goshen, where the Israelites live, will be unaffected. Now you think about that. When a land is covered, it's not just a little pocket here that is protected and all around it is surrounded. God's saying, you're going to see my hand. And this time the Israelites are going to see my hand because I'm going to cover them and they're going to be unaffected. To me, this was a judgment against Amun Ra. Sometimes it's pronounced A A M O N or uh, A M U N Ra is the more common. He was the great god and creator of all, is what he was worshipped as. His form is sometimes depicted as a crowned man or a man with a falcon's head. And it is said, I was reading a source that said this is later, and the uh, Greek visited Egypt and was so impressed with the temples and the worship he saw. To Amun Ra, that they went back, and pretty soon the Greeks, when they became the power, were worshiping Zeus. And it was I read this thing that said that the, he was later called Zeus, and given the given the credit for being the first Zeus. So talk about these different cultures that take other people's gods. Amun Ra was that impressive to the mythology and to the culture of the people that even the Greeks took him as their chief god. He was also pictured as a scarab. And this is what I, I did not understand. The, the thought process here. But because he was a sun god, the Egypt, to the Egyptians, he was pictured as a scarab pushing the sun across the sky. Now to understand what they meant by this, a scarab is a dung beetle, and it means exactly what, it, what I said. What they do is they are known to be able to push great amounts of dung in front of them. It becomes a dung ball. Or they can pull it behind them. And what they said of, of the sun as it crawled across the sky was that was raw. They looked at him as a scarab, and the sun is his dung ball, pushing that dung ball across the sky. And so the scarab became the symbol of deity, and it represented the sun god, Ra. So the scarabs started popping up on everything, and they were so popular, they were used in funerary rites, they were used in weddings, religious ceremonies. Artists love depicting the scarab in different things. When you look at Egyptian art and pottery, you find the scarab just about everywhere. With Osiris, he is, uh, I read a source that said he's, most, he's the most widely recorded Egyptian god. And in their mythology, he was self-created and became known as the sun god. And he became known as the creator of all the other gods, which, as you're going to see, comes in direct conflict with some of the others that were said to be self-created. The thing I found interesting about Amun-Ra, other than some of the stuff I've already mentioned, is it says he was a god petitioned for mercy by those sufferings for wrongs that they had done or others had done to them. If you think about these plagues, could every one of them could also be said to be directly against him. As, the, as Pharaoh and all, as all the people began suffering, they didn't cry to Amun-Ra, as it said that he was supposed to be called out to. They called out to Jehovah, God Almighty, the God of the Israelites. Pharaoh... His symbol became, or his symbol was the scarab. And this scarab was seen in everything. 
And the scarab was also representative of flies and of swarms of bugs. But with all this, the false god Amun-Ra, though the creator god, he's considered the creator, had created everything. He couldn't stop nor overturn the judgment from God. In Exodus chapter 8, verse 25, and we're going to jump down to verse 31. It says, Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Go, sacrifice to your God within the land. Verse 31. Then the Lord did as Moses asked and removed the swarms of insects from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people. Not one remained. See, unlike the frogs, God got rid of the flies. He got rid of these swarms. He drove them out of the land. But, despite all this, Pharaoh did not, he did not heed Moses' call. He also broke for the first time, saying the Israelites could leave and go serve their God, but then changed his mind. Now, he said they could go when the frogs came. But this time, he said, go and go serve your God. Go, go do as you need to do. But he, put, he kept putting conditions on it. He kept saying, but leave your women, or leave your children, or leave the livestock in one point. And Moses said, we've got to have a thing for sacrifice. And he had hardened his heart. So despite all this, Pharaoh hardened his heart, and the next plague began. What I want us to see as we look at this, Pharaoh recognized this was not just a random act of nature. If it was, he could just wait it out. He begged them to have it removed. And he didn't beg his gods. He didn't call forth all the priests of the land and tell them to start crying out to their god. He knew what it, where it was from. And yet, despite all that, he hardened his heart just as God said would happen. We'll move on to the fifth plague. The livestock died. In Exodus 9, 1-7, it says, The livestock which are in the field, on the horses, on the donkeys, on the camels, on the herds, and on the flocks, would die. In Exodus 9, verse 3. Except, 9, verse 6. So the Lord did this thing on the next day, and all the livestock of Egypt died. But of the livestock of the sons of Israel, not one died. Again, God makes a distinction. He's showing the Egyptians that He is God, and He's showing the Israelites that He is God. This judgment was on the false gods of Egypt. We've already talked about this man, or this god, Num, guardian of the Nile, the form of a bull's head, but also depicted as a ram's head. And he was called the ram god. But then we have Hathor. Hathor was called the goddess of love, motherhood, and joy. Her form was a cow, or a woman with cow's horns, holding up a sun disk. I, I found both representations here. She is as the woman with the cow horns on her head and the sun disk in between. And her form is a cow. That's not the apis bull. This is Hathor. You'll see the apis bull here in a minute. More festivals were given in her honor than any other deity, it said. And more children were named after her than any other. She was widely popular. She was very popular. In the myth, she is uh, Ra's wife. We looked at Amun-Ra. She is considered his wife. He is a sun god. Therefore, the sun disk in between her horns. She's also representative of the sun. Her priesthood was unique. Men and women both could become priests, which was unusual for the gods of that time. And along with Nut, she's associated with the Milky Way. She was a goddess of joy and was revered by women, or she was revered by women because they saw her as a multifaceted role. They saw her as a wife, lover, and mother. And so many women of that day looked to Hathor to say, I could be like that one day. And it said, I was reading it, it said, more children were named after her than any of the other pantheon of deity that Egypt had. And she was the wife of Amun-Ra. Then we, you can't talk about the bull gods of Egypt without talking about the Apis bull. He's known as the bull god. And he's called the renewal of life. He was a son of Hathor, the goddess we just looked at. His horns are also held up a sun disk. He became a funerary god with much importance to peasants and royalty alike. It didn't matter, this god was so popular with the people. Because not just royalty and, and the rich could worship him. But even a peasant could have the apis bull god present at his funeral. From the rich down to the lowly, this god was their god. When apis bull died, the land mourned. And he may have been an influence on the children of Israel. In Exodus chapter 32, when they made a golden calf. Although that could have also been Hathor or any of the others that we looked at. He was also called the herald of Ta. And I read that cow deities represented a king who became a deity after death. So in a lot of ways, the reason he was a funerary god was he was present when a pharaoh died. Because he was to be that representation of pharaoh going into the afterlife. 
after an apis bull died, because they would actually have a physical bull, not only the, the drawings and the statues and the golden images and all these other things, there would actually be a live bull. When this bull died, not only did the land mourn, but now you had to go pick the new one, because he was said to be the herald of Ta. There always had to be an apis bull. And it was interesting, when they would go to pick one out, they would go over all the land that Ta was heavily worshipped. And they had to pick out a black calf, bull calf, with a white triangle on his forehead, a white crescent moon on the right flank, a scarab mark under the tongue, and double hairs on its tail. So you can imagine the, the livestock herders and the devastation that this would have. That They all want to be the one to have the next apis bull in their flock. And God wipes them out. This wipes out the livestock. No more apis bull if this one dies. And you can imagine apis bull went too. God killed the apis bull. And there's not another one to be found to take its place. Imagine the mindset of the people. They can't find one to take its place. When, it, when this bull was found, he was given a window room in the temple to talk, given a harem of cows, and then worshipped for the rest of its life. It was said that his breath could cure diseases. So there was always a line of people to the temple of Ta to get up just to the balcony or see the apis bull to have it breathe on them if they were sick. And on special occasions and on holidays, it was paraded through the streets so that all that could get in front of it and get breathed on could be healed. And it was bedecked in jewelry, of course. But this is what they worshipped. And this is what they believed in. And God said, no. I'm killing all your livestock. But of the Israelites, I'm going to save. So even these gods that were the god of, gods of the livestock, they could not stop nor overturn the plague. In Exodus, or I'm sorry, in Exodus chapter 9, verse 7, it says, Pharaoh sinned, and behold, there was not even of the livestock of Israel dead, but the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people go. Pharaoh had to check it out himself. He had to see for himself to make sure that the livestock of the Israelites was secure. Because he didn't believe it. But even with all this, he hardened his heart, and the next plague began. We look at the sixth plague of boils. In Exodus chapter 9, verses 8 to 12, this affliction affected man and beast alike. It was a judgment against the false gods of healing. We look at the god Emhotep. He was the god of medicine, was his title. He was a real individual. He lived in the third century, or the third dynasty, under Pharaoh Dozier. He was an advisor to Dozier. But because of his uh, advances in engineering, architecture, and medicine, he was later deified and became the god of medicine, engineering, and architecture, and all these different things. He is one of the earliest names found in ancient Egypt. And because of these things I mentioned, he was deified. These are some of the depictions of him. There's also Thoth. He is called the healer of the gods. His form is a man with the head of an ibis, that is a curved bill bird, or a baboon. And it said, depending on the artist's intent. So they make him bird-like or monkey-like, it just depended. He was considered the heart or the seed of intelligence and tongue of Ra. Yet despite all this, they could not heal or overturn God's judgment. In Exodus chapter 9, verse 11, it says, The magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils, for the boils were on the magicians as well as on all the Egyptians. So the Magi who so boldly and cavalierly stood, stood against Moses and Aaron with Pharaoh and the first two couldn't even come and be part of the, con the confrontation with, with the boils because they were so covered head to toe. Despite all this, Pharaoh hardened his heart, and the next plague began. And we look at the plague of hail. In Exodus 9, 13 to 35. In Exodus 9, verse 14, he says, For this time I will send all my plagues on you and your servants and your people, so that you may know that there is no one like me in all the earth. He's telling them the point that he wants them to get out of all this. I want you to know there is none like me in all the earth. The land of Goshen would be spared, but Egypt's crops were destroyed. Look in Exodus 9, 31 to 32. It says, Now the flax and the barley were ruined, for the barley was in the ear and the flax was in bud. But the wheat and the spilt were not ruined, for they ripened late. So the crops that were ripened at that time were wiped out by the hail. This was judgment against the false gods of the sky and the crops. We talked about this, we've seen this picture before of nut. This is another very common one. And there's also a picture of her as depicted as a cow, kind of like Hathor. But this cow over the earth and everything underneath it. 
This is a picture, their depiction of the sky covering everything that goes on under, under the sun. Now you see the sun is over here by her nose. She keeps an eye on the sun. Which is odd because isn't that Ra's job? But that being aside. She was the sky goddess was her title. She is considered one of Egypt's oldest of their pantheon. Her form was a woman arched over the earth and sometimes a cow like Hathor only. The difference is she won't have the sun disc in her horns. When depicted with a crown, her headdress is a uterus shaped, her headdress is uterus shaped. So sometimes there are pictures of her as a woman depicted with a uterus shaped crown. I could find no picture online. Every picture I had it was a hieroglyph of some sort of the arch picture. She is the wife and sister to Geb, the earth god. She's the mother of Osiris and Isis, and she's called the protector of the dead as they enter the afterlife. And some of the pictures I had or I found of her as the arch welcoming those that were kind of floating up from the earth, depicting those going into the afterlife. There's also Shu. He was called the god of air and wind. His form is a crowned man. He's the father of Nut, the, the, woman, the goddess we just looked at. He carries an ankh, which was a symbol of life. And it says the, uh, he had the power of storm and calming. Think about what God is doing here, this massive storm that they have no control over, all this hail. And Horus, who is called the god of the sky, god of war, and god of protection. His form is a hawk-headed man or just a hawk. He couldn't protect the crops. In myths, in some texts, he was the husband of Hathor, not Ra. He was the god of lower Egypt. He, he was the son of Isis, and he was called to in times of distress for protection. And yet with all these different gods over the crops and over the people, not one could stop or overturn God's judgment. And in Exodus 9, 27 to 28, <clears throat> something different happens. You can kind of see Pharaoh's heart softening a little. Then Pharaoh sent for Moses and Aaron and said to them, I have sinned this time. The Lord is the righteous one, and I and my people are the wicked ones. Make supplication to the Lord, for there's been enough of God's thunder in hail. And I will let you go, and you shall stay no longer. What an interesting thing. I have sinned this time. Pharaoh would harden his heart so much against this, he'd say, no, make it go away, go away. And he goes, no, I'm not letting you go. And this time he says, tell your God, I've had enough. There's enough of this thunder and hail, make it stop. He didn't give the credit to Nut, to Shu, to Horus. He didn't call for the priests called for Moses and Aaron and even confessed sin. Wasn't Pharaoh above the law? Wasn't Pharaoh above transgression? Pharaoh himself was worshipped as a god. And yet he says I have sinned this time. But despite all this he hardened his heart. The hail went away. He hardened his heart and the next plague began. The eighth plague. Locusts. Exodus 10 1 to 20. In Exodus 10 4 to 6 we can read that the locusts will be something never seen before. In verse 4 it says, For if you refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow I will bring locusts into your territory. They shall cover the surface of the land so that no one will be able to see the land. They'll also eat the rest of what has escaped, meaning what was not destroyed in the hail, what is left to you from the hail, and they will eat every tree which sprouts for you out of the field. Then your houses shall be filled, and the houses of your servants, and the houses of all the Egyptians, something which neither your fathers nor your grandfathers have seen from the day that they came upon the earth, until this day. And he turned and went out from Pharaoh. God is telling Pharaoh what's going to happen beforehand. He's saying, if you don't let them go, something that none of your ancestors have ever seen before is going to fall upon you. Here, Pharaoh hardens his heart. He doesn't acknowledge nor recognize God. And in verse 7, it says, Pharaoh's servant said to him, How long will this man be a snare to us? Let the men go that they may serve the Lord their God. Do you not realize that Egypt is destroyed? And you might be, as a student of the Bible, we know this is only eight plague. You might say, wait a minute, this is the only, there's only seven that has happened so far. And the people are urging Pharaoh's advisors, Egypt is destroyed. And you're going to, how long are you going to let this go? Let them go. But no, he hardens his heart. And we see judgment against many of their false gods of the crops, really too many to name. So we'll go through them fairly fast. Reninutet, the goddess of harvest. Her form was a serpent or of a woman feeding Nepri, her son. This is her as a woman with a serpent's head. This is her as just a serpent. You know, see her coiled. And 
She was said to be the goddess of nourishment. And sometimes she, like Nut, is also depicted as the wife of Geb. Since it is said that snakes come forth from the earth, they likened her as a wife to the earth god, Geb. Nepri is the god of grain. He also, his title is Lord of the Mouth. And his form is always a suckling child. Now what I couldn't find is, they said lots of times his body is dotted with spots to represent grains of corn. And he's suckling from his wife or his, his mother, Reninutet, the snake goddess. You can see her snake head here instead of the, the form of a, or the face of a woman. There's also Seth, or Set, it's pronounced. He was called the god of the, des of the desert and protector of crops. He was a son of Nut, the earth god or the sky goddess that was in the shape of an arch. He was a made-up creature as his form. In fact, I was reading it, there were there are so many different sources trying to guess uh, different aspects of his face. Basically what they said is he's a made-up creature. He's a man with the head of a made-up creature. And depending on his depiction, you can always know his depiction by not knowing what the creature on his head is. And that's pretty much what they said. Because they would put a conglomeration to do a baboon's face with like an elephant's ears or, or you know, any th different kind of combination. Here, it's kind of like an aardvark, but those aren't the ears of an aardvark. And so he was a made-up he had the face of a made-up creature. In myths, he became the god of Upper Egypt, thus the desert, because he was defeated by Horus. Or, and was defeated by Horus. These false gods cannot stop or overturn God's judgment. And in fact, in Exodus 10, 16-17, notice the wording here in Exodus 10, 16-17. It says, Then Pharaoh hurriedly called for Moses and Aaron, and he said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Now therefore, please forgive my sin only this once, and make supplication to the Lord your God that he would only remove this death from me. Despite all this, after the plague was gone, Pharaoh hardened his heart, and the next plague happened. And that is darkness. In Exodus chapter 10, 21 to 29. The plague of darkness I read from one source that said, if the Bible is to believe, if the Bible is to be believed, the plague of darkness was an insult to Egypt's religion and entire culture. Well, it absolutely was. If you think about how much the sun and the Nile were in, uh, if you want to use the word cahoots, the way they worked together to form their lifestyle and culture, the things that were given life and their, their very daily way of looking at things. The sun was an integral part. That's why they gave Amun-Ra, the sun god. And yet the sun is darkened. And he said it's a darkness to be felt, was the phrase that was used in Exodus chapter 10, verse 21. Three days of complete Darkness, a darkness which may be felt. This was a judgment against the sun gods. Amun-Ra, the great god and creator of all. His form is where he looked at it, depicted as a crowned man or a man with a falcon's head. There's also Ta, who was the manifestation in the Apis bull. He holds the symbols of life, power, and stability. He was worshipped by craftsmen primarily. He was said to have created the sun, moon, and earth. Well, I thought Ra was the creator god. Where, what part did Ra play? See the the conflict here and the contradictions in their mythology. Ta was said to have created the sun, moon, and earth. His form is of a mummified, bearded man with green skin that meant for rebirth. And he was manifested in the Apis bull. The Apis bull was said to be his herald or avatar. He lived in the Apis bull. But why didn't he choose it? The Egyptians had to choose it. And they had this criteria. Anyway, there's Ta. He had Atum. Atom, Atom, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce it, but it meant the complete one. His form is Pharaoh in depiction and carries the symbols for Upper and Lower Egypt and a cross for eternal life, and he was called a sun god. What was said is he was one of the most popular ones worshipped by the Pharaohs because oftentimes it was this god that was associated when a Pharaoh died. They were carried into the afterlife by not the sky goddess, but they became or were represented by Atom into the afterlife. He was the Pharaoh's god, if you will. He was depicted as Pharaoh, the only thing different. And in the next couple pictures you're going to see, he's not wearing the Pharaoh headdress, but he's got the Pharaoh beard. He's got the fake beard. He is said to be self-created. And it's, it's him that is said to have created the first human beings. And sometimes he's depicted as a serpent. I can never find out why. But you've got the other guy, Num, who created the human body. So if he created a human being, what came first? The body or the being? I don't know. These false gods 
could not overturn God's judgment and bring back the light. For three days they were in complete darkness, a darkness which may be felt. In Exodus chapter 10, verse 24, Pharaoh relented and told Moses to take everyone out of his land. And in verses 28 to 29, he told Moses never to see his face again or he would die. And Moses responded, you're right, I will never see your face again. And despite all this, Pharaoh hardened his heart and the next plague began. I realize that we are out of time, but if you put up with me for just a little bit longer, we'll go through the last plague. The tenth plague, death of the firstborn. In Exodus 11, all the way through chapter 12, verse 30. You know, some historians and other scholars and these different people have sometimes claimed this really wasn't the hand of God. It was a childhood epidemic. This was not a childhood epidemic. Only Egyptian and Egyptian animals firstborn were killed. Why not the Israelite animals firstborn? Why not the Israelites firstborn? Not a childhood epidemic. It was very segregated. And we know the reason why the Israelites, by obedience, did not lose their firstborn. This is where they got the Passover from. They sprinkled the blood of the unblemished lamb on the doorposts. And the angel would pass by. And they dealt death to the firstborn. And God dealt death to the firstborn of the Egyptians. I was reading something and it said, The loss of the firstborn of Egypt would cripple their families emotionally and is perhaps the most devastating of the plagues. And it really is. This is a direct slap to Pharaoh. Now there have been many other things in these plagues that affected Pharaoh directly, but not to hit the deity or the deification of Pharaoh as this does. This was in judgment against their false gods, and there are too many to name them all. If you look at that chart, you can get an idea of the ones I had to leave behind. Pharaoh. I put Pharaoh first and foremost. Pharaoh was considered a god, and he was worshipped as a god, and he was considered the manifestation of Atom or Amun-Ra. They both had similar depictions. This is a depiction of Pharaoh. When he is worshipped as a god, this is what he looks like. He also carries the Ankh, which was the symbol of life and fertility, and the headdress and the cobra that we're about to talk about. And you can see him depicted here. Amun-Ra, we've talked about him already, the great god and creator of all, it is said. And Osiris, who is said the title that it ha he had was the giver of life. His form was of a crowned man. He was also considered the merciful judge of the dead. Now in their mythology, he becomes the lord of the dead, and the Greek, uh, the Greek gods would have been the equivalent, or the Greek... Becky tried to correct me on my terminology. I'm just going to forget it. The Greeks called this god Hades. If you read Greek mythology and you read of Hades and his wife Persephone, uh, Osiris and Isis are the Egyptian equivalents of those Greek gods. He was considered the god of the dead, and he's considered the merciful judge of the dead. And in the myths, he's the husband of Isis and became a god of the dead or god of the afterlife. He is always depicted with green skin to represent rebirth. Because he's also the resurrection god. He was killed by the other gods and was brought back to life. So he's also known as the resurrection god. But he didn't bring himself back to life. Another god did that. Think of the power that God showed the world on, on the day of Calvary. Isis, this was his wife. The goddess of fertility and life. Her form is a throne-crowned woman. In myths, she's the sister and wife of Osiris. And... She was uh, the goddess of motherhood, magic, and fertility. We also look at Wajit. Now, Wajit is the protector of Pharaoh. This is one that was probably, this was a direct slap to. Because not only was Wajit supposed to protect the Pharaoh, but Pharaoh's family. If you notice what Wajit is, it's a cobra. Sometimes depicted as a woman with two snakes on her head, or a snake with a woman's head. But this is the cobra on the Pharaoh's headdress. When you see a Pharaoh and they're wearing the headdress and the cobra right over their head, this, that's the depiction of the god Wajit. It's there right on their forehead as a symbol of their power, their authority, and their protection. They're protected by Wajit. And yet, who died? Direct slap to Pharaoh's family. Pharaoh was not immune to the death of the firstborn. He lost his son. These false gods could not save their children even with advanced warning. God told him what they were going, what he was going to do. In Exodus chapter 12, 29 to 33, Pharaoh, and it says, all the people of Egypt urged the Israelites to go. This was too much. This was the plague that God was leading up to. 
to show them that he even showed the people Pharaoh had no power nor authority over life or of death. And on a historical note, Amenhotep II, who was, if you look at the, the late date theory, which goes by the dating from 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 1, and the days of Solomon, if you date back to that, you get Amenhotep II. His firstborn did not succeed him on the throne, but a younger son that went by Thutmose IV. And it was interesting, I found a thing called the Dream Stella, and it tells the story how the god Haram Act promised him the throne. Now this was added to the mythology to legalize his position as king because his firstborn did not succeed him. Now I'm not saying that that is definitive proof that he was the god of the Exodus and it was his son that died, but it is interesting in the Egyptian mythology or the Egyptian history that they had this dream Stella that talks about this god having a vision telling the Pharaoh to put his fourth son or this younger son who became Thutmose the fourth on the throne in place of the firstborn. And it legalized his position as king. Despite all of this, Pharaoh hardened his heart, and it was took the deliverance at the Red Sea that was the final act that separated Israel from Egypt for good. And something that you're all knowing and can agree with me, it was a lengthy study. But not even an all inclusive one, as you can tell by the chart. And that there are many of gods or there are many of Egypt's gods that these plagues were affront to, and there are just too many to name and get into. But these should suffice to say. Egypt was suffering from idolatry. Their idolatry had so seeped into their culture that it even seeped into the Israelites. We see in Exodus chapter 32 and further on into their history. God was trying to break them of that and demonstrate to them that once and for all, there is a God and there is one God. And he had power and authority over his creation. Even the gods that they had attributed to those acts of creation could not overturn his judgments. Pharaoh told Moses... In Exodus chapter 5, verse 2, I do not know the Lord. Uh, when Hugh was here and he was talking about this, I came and told him I was in, in the beginning stages of putting all this together. And I said, oh man, I thought you were going to encroach on my toes. I thought you were going to step on my toes here. And he said, no, I'll just, everyone will just remember I started it. So I'll give him the credit. But Pharaoh told Moses, I do not know the Lord. And he says, why should I obey him? Why should I heed his voice? God told Pharaoh, for this time I will send all my plagues on you and your servants and your people, so that you may know there is no one like me in all the earth. Exodus 9, verse 14. And as you pointed out, Pharaoh was about to find out. And God told Pharaoh, you're going to know me by the time this is over. And not only Pharaoh, but remember Rahab heard about it. The Philistines heard about it. And they didn't want to mess with the Israelites or the God of the Israelites. God showed him in all of Egypt that there is none besides Jehovah God Almighty. The gods of Egypt, like those other ancient nations, the Greeks, the Romans, were very immoral. As I was reading through the mythology, and as I have seen in the Greeks and in the Romans, you could justify any way of living that you wanted to by pointing to one of their gods and say they did it. It was hard for them to have a moral law. It was hard for them to have laws that were consistent in justice and civil and criminal cases. Because of you could find a god that did something so horrible. They committed... Murder, adultery, fornication, incest, drunkenness, theft, mutilations, maiming. They acted out of greed, out of selfish ambition. They acted with no concern or thought for others. And they were held up on a pedestal as their gods. But God told his people, and later the Christians, Be holy, for I am holy. In 1 Peter 1, 14-16. I had planned to read that, and we are so out of time, I'm going to ask you to read it on your own. There is one God, and we are created in His image, and therefore held accountable to a higher way of life. We see this in Ephesians 1, verse 4, and 5, verse 27. The passage I do want us to read is Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. Saints need to give up our gods, whatever they might be, and serve God Almighty. He says, Therefore consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. Why do, they, why do these things amount to idolatry? We might say, well, I don't worship Amun Ra. I don't worship a pantheon of gods. You might not have a name associated with your priorities. But when we give in to this, impurity, passion, or evil desires, we give in to greed and covetousness, and that becomes our priority and focus in life. It has become our God. And saints are called to a much higher calling than that. We're called to believe, love, and serve 
the one true God, the God that brought the Israelites out of Egypt. We can see of the Egyptians and so many other people throughout time, they worship the creature rather than the creator. Romans 1 verse 25. In Exodus chapter 20, 3 through 4, they were told, the children of Israel were told to have no idols, to not even look like the nations around them, to not even look like the Egyptians. One of the lessons that we need to see from this is no matter what we believe or believe in, if it is not in God and in His truth, He can get destroyed because He has all authority and control over His creation. Philippians chapter 2, 9 to 11 says, Every knee will bow. 1 John chapter 5, verse 21, he says, guard yourselves against idols. He's saying, don't give in to them. Don't fall into idolatry. Philippians 2, 9 to 11, we'll close on this note. It says, for this reason also God highly exalted him, speaking of Jesus, and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It does not matter what God we want to believe in. At the end, this is what we're going to do. We're going to be on our knees confessing Christ as Lord. We either do that now in this life as His children, and can't wait, can't wait for this day, or we're going to live however we see fit in this life, and we're going to be on the knee as a conquered enemy before our God. It's up to us. The choice is ours. My admonition and encouragement to see this afternoon as we leave is let us love and serve the one and only God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. I know this has been lengthy and I really appreciate your patience and, and uh, not running for the door at seven. And we're going to go ahead and close now. If there's any here that are subject to the invitation of Jesus, whether it is the waters of baptism, that you might rise a new creature walking in newness of life and serving the powerful God that we all love and serve. Or the prayers of the congregation on your behalf for something that you might be struggling with, you can be, come forward now while together we stand and while we sing.